I never thought I'd see the day. A remote code execution vulnerability in a Rust library. This thing that we thought wasn't possible with Rust. Now I wanna highlight here, this isn't actually a memory corruption bug, it's more of a logic parsing bug in Rust, but we'll get into that. Tarmageddon, okay, this vulnerability is a really interesting case study and not only the fact that Rust can definitely have bugs that are RCE, but also a case study in abandonware. What happens if people continue to use software, forget about their software bill of materials, the code they use in their software they borrowed, and then what happens if that code they borrowed doesn't get maintained? Kind of a, a crazy scenario here. So to talk about this, we gotta kind of go into what, what are the libraries at stake? The library in question here is one known as Tokyo Tar. If you're not aware, Tokyo is a library for doing async Rust programming. Async programming is basically this ability for you as a programmer to write code that does blocking IO. For example, reading and writing very, very large files like tar files, for example. The blocking IO, if not in an async context, would cause your program to stop. That's the whole point of blocking IO. It blocks until it's complete. Now, by including an async runtime like Tokyo, you can use an event loop to basically allow the operation to run in a separate thread and allow your program to continue, do other things, and then await that result, meaning wait for the response to come back in a non-blocking fashion. It allows you to write very performant code in large, heavy blocking IO scenarios. You will see in the example here, it does a block on. Okay, so this code will naturally block. It's because it's the only operation that it does. So to get the point across, they have to block, but you could do a tar extraction using Tokyo uh, tar and it wouldn't block, which is pretty cool. Now the issue with Tokyo tar is that this code has not been maintained for over two years and there is a major vulnerability in the logic in how it parses tar files. Now, one thing we can do to stay safer online is to get a front row seat into what hackers are doing every day with today's sponsor, Flare. Flare is a threat exposure management platform that allows you or your company to see if your credentials or other sensitive company information have been lost to the dark web. Here we see that Flare is actively collecting events, almost 10 million events collected just today on things that hackers are doing on the dark web. With Flare, you can put in things like your email address, your domains, or other identifiers about you or your company so so that when Flare collects data from the dark web or other illicit channels, it can alert you immediately on collection of those identifiers. Now, literally just the other day, I got an email that said that something about Low Level Academy, my course offering, had been compromised. Now, luckily for me, not so lucky for somebody else, the credentials to somebody's account to Low Level Academy have been compromised, but I was able to know that almost instantly from when it happened. And with Flare's threat intelligence feed, you can get an active, up-to-date report on what is happening in the world of cybercrime. Coupled with their event collection, Flare Flare allows you to make a near real-time risk assessment on what is happening with your information. Guys, the best way to help the channel is to go interact with the sponsor. Go give Flare a shot. You get a free trial at the link below. Thanks again, Flare, for sponsoring this video. Back to the video. Now, the problem that Tar Tokyo has, or Tokyo Tar has, is the way that it reads the size of these headers inside the Tar archive. So generally when you have compression files, typically you have to have some kind of metadata that describes how big is the compressed blob, how big is the actual blob, how was it compressed, stuff like that. And these headers typically have sizes inside of them, right, that tell you how to continue to read the rest of the file. And so normally, a file header will contain the size of the file data that it's going to read, and will use that to advance n bytes forward to find the next header. And this is critical for security, by the way, because the scanners that are doing security scanning on maybe a Docker image, a Python package, et cetera, are using those sizes to make sure that none of the files that it can see are against the allowed uh, extension list, are malicious, et cetera, okay? Now, the fundamental issue that Tokyo Tar has is technically the Tar specification has two different types of sizes that can be read from a header, right? So there are these two sizes. One of them is the POSIX archive extended size, which allows you to denote n number of bytes for the, the size of the file. And the U star size is an older version of the tar size that you can just specify to also be a value, but it can be a different value. The problem that Tokyo Tar has is when you go to read the file here, it will use the U star value as the size and advance the cursor to read the file zero bytes, which means it will treat the file 
as a new header. What this means is you can use the U star value to trick Tokyo tar into thinking that the next byte here is the beginning of a new file. Meanwhile, a different parser, a proper parser will use the PAX size and jump ahead n bytes. So what's able to be done is this thing that's known as archive smuggling, okay? By doing archive smuggling, you're getting the code into a state where the scanner and the extractor are out of sync and you're able to hide an entire different tar archive inside of this. So kind of what's happening here is this will advance zero bytes. It'll treat the outer tar as tar number one. It'll read the inner header. It'll then go to the inner data, extract this, and then keep reading. Normal parsers that are using the normal PAX header will skip over this file completely. So what's happening effectively is you have the ability to hide files in other tar archives inside of a larger tar archive in a way that a security scanner wouldn't see it because the PAX string is going to jump over it. So what you get here is this weird scenario where you have a tar file and it goes through maybe a security scanner or a validator and the validator says, oh, I only see three files, outer, inner tar, and next. But if you use Tokyo tar, you get these five files, outer file, inner tar, inner file one, inner file two, oh, and then next file. The inner tar here was this part here that a normal parser stepped over, okay? Now this in itself may be malicious, but it's not that big of a deal because the files inside of that tar did not get extracted to the same top level. The issue that happens is this inner tar, these files get extracted which means if they have the same name as another file in the tar, you can overwrite them. And that kind of leads into the attack scenarios that uh, Adara here talks about in their Tarmageddon write-up. For example, UV, which is kind of a, a well-loved, a, a Python uh, package manager that is meant to be a replacement for pip, because pip is kind of a hellscape right now, uh, uses Tokyo tar, okay? So for example, an attacker can upload a malicious package to PyPy, and in a way that UV, when it downloads it, the UV decompressor for the tar file can overwrite the pyproject.toml that has kind of a manifest of all the files that it depends on with a malicious one. Because while the pyproject.toml may exist here, you can put a malicious pyproject inside of the inner tar, and because of that, it'll just overwrite it with the bad one. The scanner will see the good one, but the extractor will see the bad one. Not a great place to be. And the same kind of process of smuggling in malicious files that overwrite good files exists for container images and maybe DOM manifest bypass. If there's a list of accepted images, right, or accepted um, binaries that are allowed on a project and this vulnerability pattern exists in them, then you, know, you have kind of the same issue where you're overwriting good files with bad files. Uh, now, the, the primary issue here, you know, this is a vulnerability in software. Vulnerabilities can be fixed by patching, right? You write new software, you know, you have some patches that go out and maybe prioritize the PAX header or that make sure that they're both congruent, right? That PAX header equals U star, stuff like that. Uh, but the issue here is that no one is maintaining Tokyo tar. I don't know how this happened or why this happened, uh, but it is the nature of the beast. So the remediation for this is basically if your project depends on Tokyo tar, uh, move up to Astral Tokyo tar, which is the one used by UV now, I believe and Krata Tokyo Tar, which are gonna just forks of these projects that are being used to maintain them properly. And you will see very neatly that the uh, the patch is basically upgrading the tar parser to, yeah, A, prioritize those correct PAX headers for size determination over U star. So PAX is the newer field, U star is the older field, to make sure that PAX and U star headers are congruent, meaning that they are the same and that they don't like, you know, one can't point over here and one can't point over there. Uh, and then also implement stricter boundary checking to prevent data and header confusion. It's important to highlight, by the way, that like the, the problem in compression files where you have this like weird synchronization issue is not a problem in just Tokyo Tar. It is very common, a very common issue in uh, zip decompression formats, in tar decompression formats, in 7-zip, et cetera, to have the potential for this weird um, out of synchronization issue. In 2019, another issue happened where basically a threat actor got caught throwing a zip file that had an image inside of it that was also a zip file that when it got compressed in the same way, it actually extracted uh, the same PDF.exe and then from there was able to get code execution on, on the device, right? So it's not a, not exactly a new phenomenon, actually one that's happening all the time and it's very common uh, for it to happen in new implementations of decompression, uh, of decompression algorithms, right?
I want to highlight this paragraph here at the end of this article. It's very, it's very good. I want to make sure that I'm very clear in my opinions of Rust, right? A note on Rust's security boundaries and the path forward. The discovery of Tarmageddon is an important reminder that Rust is not a silver bullet. While Rust guarantees make it significantly harder to introduce memory safety bugs like buffer overflows you have to freeze, it does not eliminate logic bugs. And this parsing inconsistency is fundamentally a logic flaw. Developers must remain vigilant against all classes of vulnerabilities, regardless of the language used. This is what I've been saying for a long time, guys. It is much easier to write, actually, it's it's impossible to write unmemory safe code in Rust. Now, again, I know I know CVERS exists. Don't talk to me about that, okay? Um, but it is not impossible. It's actually very common, very likely for you to write logic bug inclusive Rust code, okay? That means ergo, ergo there may as it be, um, that Rust code can have bugs, guys. It's important that when you're looking at Rust code, you don't just be like, looks good to me, it's Rust, it's, it's completely safe. That's just not the case, unfortunately. Uh, and we can see that here in this, vulner in this, in this vulnerability write-up. And then also, you know, if you're gonna make a, a repo, maybe we, uh, you know, we keep it alive. Again, I don't know the politics or the reason why this, this repo got abandoned. I'm not really sure. I'm not gonna go into any, any particular uh, conspiracies that may exist there, but it's important to talk about. And uh, I had fun making this video. I hope you watched it. If you liked it, do me a favor, hit that like button, hit subscribe, and then go check out this other video. Nope, this other video that I think you'll like just as much, maybe, maybe less than this one, maybe more, maybe more. You could like it more than this one. That'd be cool. Okay, all right.